Thank you for joining this IFLA webinar on the upcoming Latin America and the Caribbean Regional Meeting on Libraries and Exceptions to Copyright. Today, it's going to be me, Stephen Weiber, Manager of Policy and Advocacy at IFLA. I'll share my contact details at the end. I want also to thank Violetta, Ariadna, and all the other colleagues here who have helped put this webinar together. Both this webinar and the meeting we'll be talking about are the third in a series. In addition to the Latin America and Caribbean seminar, the one we'll be talking about today, there has already been a regional seminar in the Asia Pacific region, and there will be a second one soon in the Africa region. Each has had, from IFLA, a webinar focusing on this meeting. While much of the content of these webinars will be similar, we are adapting each one to the region we'll be talking about. Therefore, in addition to an explanation of what the regional seminars are about, why we think they're important, what our objectives are, and how you can get involved, we'll also be sharing some initial analysis of what we know about exceptions and limitations to copyright for libraries in the region. It's important to note that this is not a webinar only for experts. While the language and laws around copyright may seem inaccessible, its impacts are far-reaching. Copyright is an issue everywhere, from the school or village library to the biggest national university library. And, as you'll hear, it's important that we make as many voices as possible heard in order to show that business as usual is not an option, to show how important it is to make change happen. And that's why we're so happy to have you with us on the call today. The webinar slides and recording will be made available afterwards on the IFLA website, webpage, so please feel free to share the link further and encourage others to listen. Let me first start with a few instructions for those who have never participated in a webinar with this software. Congratulations first for connecting. If you are having problems with the audio, you should look at the audio settings button on the left. If you have any technical questions, please use the chat option to send any comments or requests for support. My colleague Violetta, sitting here with me, will look to help you. I'm keen to make time for you to ask questions and make suggestions at the end. We'll leave time at the end for this. If you do have questions, please use the Q&A button. You can send these at any moment and we'll try to reply to all of these at the end of the webinar. So why copyright? In order to give you some background about the regional seminar, let's explain first, let's look first at why copyright is so important for libraries and why we at IFLA get involved with the World Intellectual Property Organization. Copyright is what gives the creator of a work, a book, a picture or a song, for example, the right to say if someone else can use it or not and to ask for compensation. This does not just give them control over who can sell a book or make translations, but also allows them to permit or forbid copying for research, education and preservation or lending, for example. Often, authors will sell this right to publishers in exchange for a sum of money, a share of revenues or both. This is why we talk about right holders. Copyright has allowed for the development of the modern book industry and provides a key means of ensuring authors are paid for their works. However, it is also a monopoly, which creates a natural tendency to set higher prices and give fewer permissions to use works than people need. In this situation, there is a risk that only those with the money to buy the right to use books and other materials are able to enjoy their rights to education and participation in cultural life. It can also mean that key public interest activities, such as preservation, don't happen because they simply aren't profitable. To combat these problems, we have limitations and exceptions to copyright. These protect the possibility for authors or publishers to earn money from their works, while ensuring that we don't have the market failures that monopolies can bring. Libraries are, of course, essential to achieving this. They are the institutions which bring exceptions and limitations to copyright to life for the benefit of all. Without these rules, libraries would not be able to lend, to copy, to support research and education, to preserve or to share for non-commercial purposes. These limitations and exceptions need to keep up to date with technological change. For example, 
Some rules only allow photocopying, but not digital copying. Interlibrary loan may work with physical books, but not digital files. There's a lot of this is linked to restrictions on the number of copies taken. When you are taking copies for digital purposes, many copies will in fact be made as part of the process. By limiting the number of copies, immediately exceptions become inapplicable to digital uses. The way in which we access digital content, often through licenses, is also a challenge. The contracts that we sign in order to obtain a license can, in, can mean that libraries li risk losing the possibility to enjoy exceptions. The law must keep up. Of course, copyright exceptions can only ever be a partial solution. They are not a replacement for proper financial support for our institutions. The same goes for museums, archives, schools and research centres. But in a modern world, libraries need modern exceptions and limitations that enable them to use digital tools to work across borders in pursuit of their mission. And too often, they simply don't have it. So why WIPO? So WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization, is the United Nations agency in charge of intellectual property. This includes patents, trademarks, and copyright, for example. As a United Nations agency, the World Intellectual Property Organization is open to all UN member states to join, and indeed, almost all have done so. WIPO works in a number of different ways. It provides a lot of capacity building and training at the national level, manages databases, and provides tools for intellectual property offices, and also registered pat registers patents and trademarks internationally. It also produces valuable research and guidelines for policymakers, creators, and users of intellectual property around the world. But the most high profile work it does is doubtless's role in negotiating treaties. Such treaties are essential in order to support the recognition of the rights of creators from one country in another and vice versa. In doing so, they make it easier to exchange and to work across borders. But they are a far more, they are a far more efficient way of doing things than bilateral agreements. One treaty can replace hundreds, if not thousands, of deals between individual countries. But such texts don't only need to be about rights. They can also be about exceptions to rights and how these work across borders. In a globalised world, it is more and more common for libraries to cooperate in order to fulfil their missions as part of preservation networks through international document supply and supporting online distance learning. The exceptions that allow libraries to do their work nationally need to work internationally too. This is what the Marrakesh Treaty looks to do as an example. As you'll know, this treaty allows libraries and other institutions to make accessible format copies for persons who are blind, visually impaired, or otherwise print disabled, with no need to request the authorization of the author or right holder. They can also exchange these works internationally with countries that have also ratified the treaty. First and foremost, the Marrakesh Treaty is an important step forwards in terms of making it easier for libraries to help users with print disabilities. While countries were free to pass rules benefiting people with such disabilities, we have seen with Marrakesh how the existence of a treaty can have an impact on national law. It is, in effect, the fastest ratifying treaty in the history of WIPO, which shows the interest of member states in fulfilling its objectives. It also illustrates two key ways in which action at WIPO can respond to real world challenges. First of all, it has provided the impetus to member states to reform their copyright laws to support the public interest, as well as guidelines on how to do this. There was general consensus, just as there was around people with print disabilities, of the importance of libraries and activities and the activities they support. And of course, as mentioned above, changes in national laws are possible without a treaty. We're seeing great work in South Africa at the moment, for example, and have also seen this recently in Argentina and in Colombia. But for many countries which face pressing challenges and which may not have the capacity to prepare laws, this sort of uh, this support is important. It also makes clear 
that such exceptions and limitations are allowed under international law. Copyright reforms can become very political and many governments need reassurance from organisations like WIPO in order to know that they are doing the right thing, whatever they hear. Secondly, Marrakesh has provided a key, clear and legal means for libraries to cooperate across borders. Because when copyright regimes are too different from one country to the next, when they do not explicitly allow the sharing of works across borders in the context of standard library activities, it, when they do this, they stand in the way of progress and the expectations of library users. It's important to note in all of this, just as was the case with the Marrakesh Treaty, that it's not a question of destroying markets. Libraries want authors to be fairly remunerated. Instead, it's a case of responding to situations where market solutions are not appropriate for achieving public interest goals. Action around exceptions and limitations to copyright has been on the agenda since around 2007 at WIPO, and IFLA has been engaged since the beginning. During meetings of WIPO's Copyright Committee, the Standing Committee on Copyright and Related Rights, or SCCR, there was discussion about exceptions and limitations to copyright. Based on studies by Professor Kenneth Cruz, and the inputs of IFLA and its partners and member states, the committee has explored those provisions in copyright law that allow cultural heritage institutions to perform their missions. This work has underlined the broad support for the work of libraries, but also the costs of excessive inconsistency between national laws and the lack of provision for cross-border collaboration. Since 2011, libraries have been promoting the idea of an international treaty on copyright exceptions for libraries, archives and museums, one that establishes a basic set of exceptions for all countries, creating a framework for national copyright laws that is flexible and consistent with existing international law, one that does not seek to impose harmonisation or a one-size-fits-all approach, but that does work across borders. This is what we've seen with Marrakesh. As mentioned earlier, this has boosted change at the national level and given legal provisions a cross-border effect. While there has been progress, some members, mainly the European Union, have however blocked discussions on exceptions and limitations for libraries from going further. They argue that they do not want an international legal instrument, despite committing to this in 2012. We need to break through this blockage in order to deliver an international solution, both in order to update national laws and to make it easier to work across borders. That is why advocacy work is so important to WIPO. Decision makers need to understand the importance of exceptions and limitations to copyright for libraries and to take action at the international level. Put simply, business as usual, not doing anything, is not good enough. In terms of the type of provisions that IFLA and its partners believe need to be covered in any international instrument, these are mainly exceptions and limitations to copyright for the following activities. Library lending, document supply, the preservation of library and archival materials, use of works for education, research and private study, use of works for personal and private purposes, and access to orphan works. We are arguing that these rules should apply to all of libraries, archives and museums, rather than having separate texts. These institutions face very similar challenges in their works, and in many cases are part of the same institutions. Different rules for different activities could therefore be harmful. All of the exceptions mentioned here, we argue, should also work across borders. Libraries should be able to carry, uh, should be allowed to buy books from abroad, even when they're already on sale or someone has the right to sell locally, but isn't. They should also be protected when the contract terms under which they access works try to take away the possibilities given by exceptions to copyright. There should be the right to remove or get around technological protection measures that prevent libraries, archives and museums from making use of exceptions. And finally, we're calling for an limitation on liability for libraries, archives and museums. Librarians and other professionals should not be responsible for the acts of library users if they've already explained what they can and can't do. Also, librarians and other professionals should not be held responsible, should not be held liable 
when they make a mistake while acting in good faith. It's worth noting that colleagues from education and research organisations have also drafted a treaty whose focus is to ensure that copyright does not stand in the way of these activities. As mentioned earlier, progress has not been easy. Representatives of the European Union in particular have blocked efforts by group of developing country, groups of developing countries to move towards some sort of law. Nonetheless, the time has been useful. As we've mentioned above, we've seen a number of studies that have not, not only underlined how diverse um, national provisions are, but also how many countries lack modern exceptions to co limitations to copyright for their libraries, archives and museums. But it's clearly now time to move forward. Seeing this, the WIPO Secretariat proposed an action plan, a list of activities that would help create international consensus on the way forwards on these topics. One of the most important action points are three regional seminars. These aim, according to the document, to analyse the situation of libraries, archives and museums, as well as educational and research institutions. So they look for areas for action with respect to the limitations and exceptions regime and the specificities of the region. The first of these wo wo workshops took place in Singapore for, for the Asia Pacific region on 29th, 30th of April. We'll talk a little bit about more of this in a second. The second workshop will be held in Nairobi, Kenya, on 12th, 13th of June for Africa. And the third and final one will take place in the Dominican Republic for the Latin American Caribbean region on the 4th and 5th of July. WIPO is inviting officials from copyright offices from all countries in the region to these events. There will also be some WIPO officials and, of course, civil society organisations such as IFLA, AFLIA and IFL, as well as bodies representing archives, museums and teachers. As mentioned, we have of course now had the first of the three seminars held at the National Library Board in Singapore. The meeting was a great success. It was a great opportunity to talk with national officials, to hear about their laws and the experiences of their libraries, archives, museums and educational research bodies. There was a clear recognition that laws needed to change, to give librarians, archivists, museum personnel, teachers and researchers clarity about what they can do to ensure that libraries, archives and museums can use the same rules, to let our institutions carry out preservation across borders, to reflect the expectations and needs of users in a digital age. Indeed, three of the four sub-regional groups created by WIPO called through international instruments. The fourth, the Pacific region, was also clear that they wanted support internationally to help pass better reforms. This seminar has sent a strong message and one that we hope will be repeated in Africa and Latin America and the Caribbean. As the Singapore workshop has illustrated, these meetings provide a unique chance to make the case for international action. Rather than theoretical debates between delegates in Geneva, these meetings will hear about what is happening on the ground. You will have an important role in making this happen. We need to raise, raise awareness around the challenges that librarians face in preserving and providing access to cultural heritage and information, and in supporting research and education when the right laws are not in place. We need to explain why the national, approach, national level approach is not enough why collaboration at the international level is needed. We need to show how effective libraries benefiting from proper laws bring major benefits to society without meaning that authors will no longer be paid. This is because after the three regional seminars have taken place, the conclusions will be brought to an international conference on exceptions and limitations. This will take place in October in Geneva, right before WIPO's Copyright Committee meets. It will decide what steps WIPO takes next, whether we can advance towards an international instrument or other actions to support libraries, archives, museums and education and research. What is said in Nairobi, as well as what's been said in Singapore, and what will be said in Santo Domingo, will have an echo and will help build momentum for change. One of the very useful things that WIPO has done, as mentioned, is to commission studies 
that look at existing exceptions and limitations to copyright for libraries and other institutions, as well as for education and research across WIPO's member states. The study for libraries was developed by Professor Kenneth Cruz. It's been updated twice, with the latest version coming from 2017. We've used this study to have a look at the landscape of exceptions and limitations to copyright in the Latin American Caribbean region. And here are some of the findings. So first of all, a large number, so six countries in total, 18% of the total, simply have no library exceptions or limitations at all. In these cases, pretty well any activity carried out by libraries is most likely not legal under the current system. We therefore need to move, uh, therefore there is a pressing need to try and get any library legislation passed. In terms of one of the next, one of the key functions of libraries in terms of supporting research, we can see that 55% of countries in the region do at least have exceptions to copyright, allowing libraries to take research copies of works. However, in many of these cases, there are limitations on the numbers of copies that libraries can take. This effectively means that digital copies or copies of digital works are therefore impossible. It's not simply not possible for libraries to support research in the modern age. As we can see, instead of 55% of countries having such rules, now only 21% can support digital research. Looking at preservation, an even higher share of countries have exceptions allowing libraries to take copies for preservation or for the replacement of works that have been lost. However, once again, if we look at the number of countries which don't place any limits on the number of copies that libraries can take in order to support preservation, in fact, there's only one country in the entire region which would allow for digital preservation under the current law. This highlights the need for the modernization of copyright laws, at least on the basis of 2017 data. Another way in which libraries support research is by making sure that users in one library are able to access works in other libraries when this isn't held locally. This can be done through interlibrary loan. However, as this map and as these figures show, only three countries in the region, 9%, allow for this. Another way of doing this is by sending a copy of a work to another library. A slightly higher share, around 10, 10 countries or 30%, do indeed allow for this. Nonetheless, this is a very relatively low share given the number of countries in the region. Libraries in this otherwise are simply not allowed to help users in other libraries. Another way in which libraries can help, can give access to works is by giving access to di digitized copies on dedicated terminals. Libraries may want to do this because the original copies are held in the stacks or simply they're vulnerable and could be easily be damaged. By giving people access through dedicated terminals, the risk of further damage is removed. However, only two countries in the region allow for this sort of access. Finally, and a major example, um, in many countries, uh, it's set down in WIPO law that it is possible to apply technological protection measures or digital locks to work in order to prevent piracy. The problem is, a lot of the time, these locks are actually to stop preventing uses which are allowed under exceptions and limitations. As we can see in this, as we can see here, less than 20% of countries actually make it clear, in less than 20% of countries, is it clear that libraries can remove digital locks that prevent them from carrying out their mission. However, in nearly 40% of countries in the region, digital locks are protected no matter what. In all of these countries, it is therefore up to the right holder to decide whether they want to apply a digital lock or not, and so effectively to decide whether libraries, archives and museums are able to take advantage of exceptions and limitations. So, this is a quick run through the, the data, and this slideshow this slide will be available on our site. What's important now is, well, what are we doing? Now, IFLA will be present at the regional seminar in Santo Domingo. We will defend the interests of the profession and call for copyright regimes that favour access to information. We'll bring examples of the work that librarians do in the region, 
and how they how libraries are impacted by copyright. We will underline the benefits of cross-border collaboration and the need for an international treaty. We'll work closely with archives, museums, education and research organisations and others in order to defend common needs and to ensure that our voices are heard. Some of the logos of our partners are included on this slide. However, it's member states themselves who will have the most powerful voices at this seminar. They are the ones whose contributions will feed into the discussions in Geneva. They are the ones who will take the final decisions about WIPO's future work. To ensure that they do, it's vital that they are prepared before they travel. And this is where you come in. In short, we need you to convince your government of the importance of the right copyright laws, both nationally and internationally. And here's some ideas for how you can do it. First of all, identify national contacts on copyright and WIPO's Standing Committee on Copyright and Related Rights. As mentioned before, Almost every UN member state is represented at WIPO. If you can't find out from your copyright office, ask IFLA who went to the previous meeting, if anyone. You'll see our contact details at the end. You can also see a link on this slide to WIPO's own list of copyright and intellectual property offices. We'll share these slides, as mentioned before, on the event page for this webinar, as well as on our new page of background resources for the seminars, so that you can access them there. You can also write to the government ahead of SCCR meetings and regional seminars, highlighting what libraries are doing and what's at stake. You can make sure that they have heard about the concerns of the library sector. Make sure that they hear support for an international instrument from the library sector. We will provide you with ideas and templates on how to do this. You can also share examples of how copyright impacts your work. These will help us show the work that you're doing to your representatives. This is perhaps even the most valuable information in our advocacy efforts, something that shows that what we're talking about is real and that the people we are talking to can do something. And on this, only you can provide it. You can, of course, watch this webinar again. You can follow us on social media using the hashtag Copyright for Libraries. And of course, join NIFLA's Copyright and Other Legal Matters Network in order to share news about what's going on nationally and beyond, or even to ask questions. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, I would welcome any questions that you have. Please use the Q&A button here, and we will happily get back to you. Okay, so thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, I will now go to the final slide with my email address on it. Um, Please let me know if you have any further questions. Thank you, Claudia. You just mentioned that there's a, a LAC network. So there's also, in addition to the global CLM network, there is also the Latin American Caribbean network on copyright, Red LACTA, the Spanish acronym. Um, and so if you look for that, you'll be able to find out more. So as said on the slide, a recording from the meeting will be available afterwards. And if you have any further questions, Please do join. Thank you very much.